mendelspark.com Advancing life science research, connecting people and ideas. We're back at the offices of Ingenuity Systems for the second time. This go-round, we're interviewing a newcomer to the team, Nathan Pearson. He's sporting the title Principal Genome Scientist here at Ingenuity. Formerly, Nathan was the Senior Director of Science and Research at NOME. For more than a decade, Competitive Group has helped science-based companies build and execute innovative marketing campaigns. They love science, they love marketing, they love the idea of combining the two to make great things happen for your marketing communications. Thank you for having us over. Welcome. What does it mean that you've left Gnome and you're now at Ingenuity? For me, it means a, a chance to put my shoulder behind what I think has a platform that has a really high ceiling for bringing genomes into everyone's life in a more substantive way, longer term. High ceiling? Yeah. Like, what do you mean by what that? I mean by that is that the Ingenuity platform is open and shareable in the sense that it's already a web-based platform. It's a secure web-based platform where people can bring genome data that's been called, so human genomes come into the system. They can be very richly annotated using a leading knowledge base in the industry, so Ingenuity's bread and butter for 15 years has been developing this knowledge base of what, what genes do in the body. And then those genomes can also be sensibly compared in very powerful ways to understand what genetically distinguishes sick people from healthy people in, in the data sets, et cetera. But importantly, they can also be shared. So the, the, data, the, um, the system is ready to broker sharing among collaborative researchers, so people who are ready to share data with each other. And as that becomes more possible with permissions, uh, we'll be able to gather bigger and bigger data sets of genomes together and thereby understand them faster and more accurately. So what's the most important thing you learned at Gnome that you're bringing here? I mean, Gnome was in the business of genome interpretation. Yeah. Really one of the first in that space. Right. So the first thing to learn is it's hard. Right? It's incredibly hard. So a single genome, reading it out, if we brought an auctioneer in here to read out your genome, would take about 35 years. And that's at like six or something like that, six letters per second. Uh, and that's one genome. So imagine now bringing to the table hundreds or thousands of genomes, as you'll need to do to understand complex disease. And you can imagine this sort of bioinformatic challenge of doing that. But everyone in the industry knows that. I think what I learned specifically being at Gnome for the past few years was how regimented a craft software development is and how important it is to do that uh, in, a very much, in a much more systematic way than I was used to coming out of the academic world where software is written for use in this project over the course of this graduate student or postdoc's term in the lab, et cetera. And the, the software doesn't have to be forward compatible in a way that commercial software does. And so seeing, working every day with, with software engineers there and now here, uh, and working with a team of very talented people who are building software for the, for the long run here to be robust has really taught me a lot how, about how that process is, is really rigorous and systematically planned. So that's probably a major point for bioinformatics right now, is going from these original you know, public online yeah. software. Seat of the pants. Seat of the pants, okay, to something more systematic and, and uh, sort of in general use, would you say? Yeah, sort built for generality and to last, I think, for those two, those two priorities. And so what are the challenges of doing that here? Well, the challenges, many of the challenges are domain specific. I mean, we're dealing with huge data sets that are from people who are not a good model organism. They're, they're, you know, we're, we, we can't be readily bred in laboratories in ways that would let us understand human biology quickly. Uh, and so we have to gather data as we can from the world around us, from, from the population, and that's hard, and that takes time, and it's massive data, as, as we said. So some of the challenges there are really specific to what we do as human genomics bioinformaticians. But I think in, in the broader scope, uh, they're the classic questions of developing good public reference data sets that are useful but fluid enough as knowledge advances to, to still to be useful, more useful next year, so not freezing too, too hard on the, on the reference data today bringing those together in integrative ways that let you make sense of them. So you know, we hear constantly a uh, pressing need to integrate, say, RNA sequencing data with, with genome data to understand why you see two different transcripts uh, expressed at different levels in the genome, or why you see two different alleles expressed in, from someone's genome, uh, to trace those differences to genetic differences. Uh, that's a big challenge, that, that kind of integrative approach to bioinformatics. And I think, um, you know, and, and one further overarching question is, what do we mean by bioinformatics? I think it's a, it's a loosely, in, in many ways, ill-defined 
term, a bioinformatician. So what do we mean by it? Well, so I think in, in the minds of many people, you know, a bioinformatician is, is either, uh, you know, a glorified device for, for turning coffee into uh, flat files, so to paraphrase Alfred Rennie, or, or people think of a bioinformatician at the other end of the spectrum as, as being a geneticist, and they, they don't understand necessarily that bioinformaticians do have very, very refined skill sets that, that have to, to, to stay, to keep pace with currently evolving tools and, and methods. But they also need to work side by side with folks who have expertise from the biology, from, from, from the wet lab side, and from the genome side. So, for example, coming here to Ingenuity, Ingenuity has a, 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 you know, more than 14 years now of deep experience in curating what could be said functionally about genes in the human genome or in other genomes. Mm -hmm. in order so really strong on that biology genetics. Side. Well, it, yes, and it, but and coming from it from the functional annotation side, so bringing together what can be what's published in the literature, curating it expertly, understanding what uh, what evidence counts and, and should count less in, in judging what a given gene does, but much of that insight came, I think, you know, especially early on from before the genome era, before the era of whole genome sequences, when we were drawing functional insights from model organisms mostly. From in vitro studies, from um, from all kinds of, uh, of, of kind, all kinds of lines of evidence, other than what do we see in terms of genetic variation. So I think the kind of perspective that I can help bring to that that deep foundational knowledge base is the perspective of a human genomicist, someone whose expertise and training is rooted in genome structure, function, variation, and what we can learn from that from the sort of patterns of variation we see in a population to complement what's understood from, from knocking a gene out in a mouse or from, knock, or from expressing a gene in an in vitro cell line and seeing how, how its protein uh, interacts with other proteins. That kind of knowledge is complementary in ways that are crucial for understanding disease and other phenotypes going forward for, for people. I, I know in the past when I talked to Ingenuity, um, they have a team of ontologists. Yeah, and they right. seem to be sort of really strong with that. Yeah. How important is it that we have common on top? Oh, it's fantastic. Here? It's incredibly important. Uh, and, and I'm not to just echo your question, but it, you hit on something really, really important. Um, first of all, in, in the sense of a, of a phenotype ontology. So it's if you look out there in the literature, you'll see papers about diabetes that refer to it as type two diabetes, diabetes mellitus two, uh, diabetes mellitus, diabetes comma type two. You'll see various references to the same entity mm. in the literature. Mm -hmm. It's important to know what those synonyms are, but it's also important to know that diabetes is a metabolic disease, and uh, that it's, so in that sense, it's nested with other metabolic diseases under a node in, in, in a well-structured ontology that you could call the metabolic disease uh, branch of the ontology. Um, and, it, and it's important to be able to really structure phenotypes that way so that you can then compute on them and say, aha, I know this gene is relevant for this phenotype. And it's pretty close in terms of the overall tree of phenotypes to another one that I'm studying. And so therefore, maybe it's more likely relevant to this disease than another one far away in the tree. So that phenotype ontology is crucial, being able to talk about the same entity with the same term or, or, or understand when they're different, uh, and also being able to nest them in ways that reflect the underlying similarities or differences among those phenotypes. Likewise, when you come to a complicated space like the genome itself, or like genes, it's really important to have good terminology for understanding uh, that we're talking about the same thing. And here we get into, say, the reference genome. In the human reference genome is, is one of those, it's sort of like the weather. It's like everyone talks about it and often complains about it, but, but um, there are a few people doing much about it. There, there's, so mm -hmm. one person who's very important to know about is, is Deanna Church, who is sort of the other most important church in genomics, uh, besides George. And she's doing yeoman work, trying to really nail down what a representative human reference sequence looks like in exact detail. Now, even when she does that, we face a big challenge, because that reference sequence that everybody uses and wants to use is being uh, overloaded in some ways. We're, we're, we're using it for three purposes when it really shouldn't be used that way. So we're trying to use it as a common a coordinate system for knowing where in a genome we're talking about. We're, that's use number one. We're trying to use it uh, as a way of uh, so, sort of uh, understanding how genomes differ from each other. So uh, as a sort of common, uh, common denominator or a, a, um, a, a gold standard against which to compare so we can know how two genomes differ from each other. And finally, we're, people are trying to use it as a, as a healthy genome, as an example of something healthy. 
And that's too much for one reference genome, in my opinion. And so, so the, the answer there? Well, there's a couple answers. So, so one of the reasons we need a reference genome is for, is for upstream alignment, so for characterizing a genome when it's sequenced with short reads. So there, you really want to align the reads from a given genome to a reference genome that is as similar as possible to that genome, so that all the reads, all the reads that can align do, and you get the most information out of it. And so you're seeing efforts in some cases to try to do, say, ethnicity-specific reference uh, mapping. So mapping to a genome that's known to be, or a priori should be closer to the genome that, uh, of the person you're looking mm -hmm. at. So a little bit more specific. Right. And so that's one use of, of a reference genome, and that's upstream. But the other use, downstream, which we do, which is reporting uh, what we reporting variants, so reporting uh, what a, a given genome looks like. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we need a coordinate system for that. But the the current reference genome, we should I think we should throw out the idea that it's going to be a healthy one or a perfect one. And I, I actually have an idea which I share with a lot of other people out there. Uh, so, for example, Shuganti Balasubramaniam has written a paper uh, with some other folks about this, where you can uh, you can reconstruct what the last common ancestor of all people carried at each position in that, that person's haploid genome. So you, get, you basically reconstruct what the ancestral reference looked like. And in many ways, that, that reference genome, an ancestral reference genome, would serve as a, as a more, um, more objective and less problematic standard than the, than the cobbled together um, sort of chimeric reference genome of uh, some modern people's stretches of the genome that we have today. Uh, and the, the problem, of course, is that, you, you know, you look for a reference genome that's healthy. Well, what does it mean to be healthy? A variant that contributes to, uh, to cancer risk might also help you with wound healing, mm -hmm. right? Uh, or you try to pick a reference genome that is the most common variant. Well, the most common variant among whom? Which population in the world? And that changes over time as we evolve as mm -hmm. a population. So what's common today could be rare tomorrow. So those are very unstable and, uh, and subjective kinds of reference genomes to try to build. Whereas an ancestral reference genome at least gives everyone, you know, a, sort of a, a flat field against which to compare. Uh, we, we can infer at most sites what that looked like, that, that ancestral sequence. And we can also infer overall patterns of mutation. So we can say, for example, we can ask a question like, um, you know, when you have insertions and deletions next to uh, a cytosine, do you, do you more often see insertions or deletions? And that's an empirical question. Right now, you can't answer that question very well unless you know that the change was an insertion or deletion. And against the current reference genome, you don't know that because it could have been inserted into the current reference genome or it could have been deleted from it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So knowing that, can, you know, using an ancestral reference could also let us infer uh, summary patterns of mutation and, and substitution of, and evolution of what happens to the mutation after it arises uh, in ways that the current reference can't let us do. So it would be in many ways a, a better reference to use for all kinds of purposes. Come back to ingenuity for a moment. Yeah. Uh, what, is, what is your clearly defined sort of first goal here? So right now, um, most studies of, of human whole genomes are based on a few genomes, you know, a, a single genome or a trio or a, set of, a small set of probands. But going forward, everyone recognizes that we're going to be looking at hundreds or thousands of genomes at a time. And I think I, I would love for our platform to be the place where that is possible at the push of a button. So you, you click a button and you kick off the latest and best versions of what are called, say, rare variant burden tests, which are complex, they're statistically hard tests that you have to run to detect uh, disease phenotype, genotype phenotype associations in big data sets that may trace to variants that are too rare individually to be significant, but together cluster in a part of the genome that is significant. Now, already the platform lets us do that. So we have some of the, the, the latest and best rare variant burden tests built into the platform today, and you can run them on a GUI, in a, in a very simple GUI, uh, without running command line the way that many people have had to do so far. I think going forward, as those tests evolve, uh, we're going to see, in our platform, we're going to see refinements to make sure we're, we're getting better and better data going into them, so up, upstream quality control in, in those tests and being able to understand and visualize the results downstream and really get to the bottom by leveraging that knowledge base of functional annotation. So once you know that, say, you know, rare variants in this disease, in folks with this disease, tend to cluster in, in these 10 genes, which of those 10 genes is the most likely and most plausible candidate for being relevant to that disease based on what we already may know from mouse or from other, other lines of evidence? 
that's where our you know ingenuity's knowledge base is really sort of the big you know it's really like the big gun that can help really narrow down that shortlist to 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 the ones that are really relevant. It's not just me who is excited about the platform, right? We're seeing incredible excitement among users, and I, I think we're seeing that immediately with a lot of exomes coming to the system today. We're starting with exomes. I think eventually people will be moving towards you know all whole genomes ideally, um, but but for right now there's a lot of targeted sequencing data sets and exomes coming into the system that are already sort of churning through and being made sense of. And, uh, and so people are recognizing the value outside of the organization as well, which is very gratifying to, I think, all of us here. So what's it going to take to get the end user buying? Right. So the end user, the, the buyer in that equation, in many cases, is the payer. So ultimately, either it's either somebody willing to pay for health care themselves, or it's an insurer or a state in some other countries that's paying for health care. And so those folks tend to be experts in actuarial value, in knowing when something is worth paying for. Uh, that's their job, insurance companies, right? So we have to be very careful in genomic medicine that we don't get ahead of ourselves with hype. We don't uh, make, make promises about the value of genomic medicine that are quickly not kept, and that would set back then the whole field 10 years if payers then get very shy about paying for it. So I think there's an arc to how, how this will be adopted, and, and this isn't you know, an, a new thought, but the first use is really urgent diagnostic use. So sick kids and tumors, right? And in both cases, you have, I, I think of them as basically, in both cases you have a tissue growing too fast to wait. So either you have so, a child. Uh, just give us what you got. Right, right. You have a sick child, and, and that child is growing very fast. You can't wait for sequencing to get cheaper. You do something, you sequence now and see if you can get a foothold into the biology of what's going wrong in order to be able to alter care. Likewise with a tumor, you have a, a lump of cells that's growing way too fast to wait. You can't wait for you know, the thousand dollar genome, you sequence now and you see what, you can, what kind of foothold you can get into, the, into what's going on uh, etiology, you know, in terms of the etiology. Now the next use, I think you could think of as sort of urgent prognostic use. So. Uh, prenatal use or, uh, or couples, couples screening, for example, of eventually doing whole genome couple screening. This is, not, uh, this is you know, an interesting world to think about. Um, it's fraught with some ethical questions, but I think one of the key points there is that in the long run, whole genomes w will help or can help people find that they can marry and have healthy kids with anybody. Eventually, that could be even people of the same sex, but uh, for now, it could be people who, uh, who want to know what few variants, if any, they may share with a, with a potential spouse that they may have to worry about in, in a child. And so that, that's sort of an urgent prognostic use where you, you have an immediate plan where you can alter that plan based on what you find out. The long run, the, you know, the, I think what's viewed as sort of a societal gold mine for, for people uh, interested in healthcare generally is of course prognostic use for the rest of us. So mm -hmm. for long term, you know, birth to old age, understanding disease risk and being able to predict and act on it. And that's going to take a lot more data. So in addition to being a lot more data, a lot more data, and, and actually uh, better ways of, of interpreting that data, so more sophisticated math, basically. Um, we're going to need phenotyped genomes. So not just we, people talk about the genome data and it floods in, but we also need good phenotype data to, to be able to understand that together. And there's no, aside from a, you know, a transcriptome, there's no high throughput phenotyping right now. That needs to be standardized. We need to collect better data on that. And, and that, that kind of effort is probably, you'll see it happening over the next few years as big data sets start to come in of, of well phenotyped whole human genomes that can be tracked over time to understand how people with particular variants or particular genotypes uh, do or don't get sick in particular ways. And so that, that's going to be crucial for that long term question of, of making uh, your genome informative as part of your daily health care. Uh, and that's where the value is. But that's going to take time. What are your thoughts on the tool space and the sequencing? Is it, is it good enough? Uh, it's, so it's, it's good enough for now. We can, in other words, people should, can't, they, they should be in our sequencing now. Uh, and you're getting great insights from sequence. Now in the long run, long read sequencing will, will help things a lot too. We'll be able to actually infer haplotypes, that is which variants are, are found together on the same copy of a given chromosome. And that can matter in terms of uh, how those those particular variants may interact with each other or with other variants. Okay, so you're a believer in this long read gospel. Oh yeah, it's important. It's really strong this year. It's important, and, and this is a lot of this is like you know, uh, are computers good enough? Well, yes, they're good enough for now, but that doesn't mean we don't we stop improving them. Uh, and you know, a computer ten years ago is it was good enough for you to be writing your papers on it. 
you wouldn't be using the same computer today. And I think the same will hold for sequencing technology is eventually we're gonna have single chromosome, end-to-end, -end, uh, accurate and, and, and reliable sequencing. Right now we're not there yet, but we do have reliable enough sequencing to draw real firm insights from for research and in some cases for clinical use now. So we've all heard the phrase, the thousand dollar genome, the million dollar interpretation. Yeah. Your thoughts on that? I mean, is what you're doing here at Ingenuity going to bring costs down there? Uh, I think, I, well, I think it's part of, yes, it's part of its height of, of, um, of improving methods that will bring down the cost of, of really understanding a set of genomes well. Uh, and we're already doing that. I mean, certainly we don't charge a million dollars. Um, and, and we get a lot of insight out of the data that we have in our platform. Um, now, what will happen longer term to the, you know, the cost model there, I, I, it's, that's beyond my pay grade to, to worry about um, in, in terms of, uh, you, you know, will it be packaged together with sequencing, et cetera. Uh, those, are, those are longer term questions for the field. So looking forward, where do you think Ingenuity is going to make the most headway? Right, I, I'm going to tell you about right now because that's that's really the you know the task at hand for us is helping researchers understand whole human genomes, and that's that's you know in in my part of the ship here, which is ingenuity varying analysis. This platform, it's a web platform for for uploading and annotating and comparing whole human genomes. Um, that's where we can make a lot of uh, a lot of headway with folks right now is helping make that process easier and helping people get better answers faster there. And you know you hear a lot in, in discussing whatever product it may be. There's always the question, the, the three-way trade-off among, you know, fast, good, or cheap. In the end, this is about speed. I, I think that's not even a question because it, in the end, if how, how fast you can you can find a variant or, or do how fast you can get your answer, get your answer, and, and, and importantly, the right answer. So to me, that that priority of speed mm -hmm. subsumes the other two mm -hmm. because. If you if you're uh, you know if you're too expensive, that means the, the person has to wait until they can afford doing it, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And if if you're not good enough, that means they have to do it. They have to interpret again in order to get that answer. So to me, it all it all comes down to getting that that right answer fastest. And the ways that you can increase the speed is well. So uh, two, I think two ways. So one actually, there's three ways. Now that I think about this, so the first is better number crunching of the genome data. So being able to characterize accurately what that genome really looks like and then compare it to the others quickly. So doing mass, so you know, the key, the key questions you want to ask are, is this variant real, right, number one? If so, who is it in? Which genomes in the world is it in? And it could be in the, these sick genomes, but also these, he these healthy genomes, and then it's less relevant. Um, and then uh, what does it do? So what does it do to the biology of a gene? What does that gene do in turn in the body? What, is, what does that process in the body have to do with this disease? So understanding those three questions fast is the key here. And uh, the platform, you know, the reason I'm here at Ingenuity was I recognized the amazing promise of this platform to answer those questions really well. So we can bring in data uh, from any of the major sequencing platforms today. We can help folks assess what's real, what's valid in it, and to give you an example there, there are, many genome, sorry, there are many genes that show up uh, in study after study as sort of first pass candidates and turn out to be false leads. And they're the same genes. We call, I, I call them the usual suspects. You know, so CDC27 and, and ACNAC2 and any, any bioinformatician I'm speaking to right now will recognize some of these gene names um, that they've seen on, on study after study regardless of the phenotype. We can help, with our experience, we can help quiet that noise. So our platform knows about those genes and it knows to sort of like quiet down the signal from those genes when you get your data back and see what the most interesting headlines are. So what's real? What's, uh, you know, who's it in? So being able to figure out which uh, of the genomes share a particular variant at the right zygosity to be interesting. So if we assume it's a recessive in these, in, uh, in, in these kids, for example, we were looking for a sharing of, of homozygous variants uh, that are not homozygous in the controls in the family, et cetera. Uh, so, and then you look more broadly in the, in the larger population, who, who has it out there, how common is the variant generally. So those kinds of questions the system can help people answer, you know, like answer fast now as well. And increasingly for bigger data sets where you do have to use those, those uh, rare variant burden tests to look at big case control cohorts, we've, we've sped that process up about a hundredfold over the command line version of the same tool. So you can run it at, at the click of a button, but also run it faster and get the same robust result. 
So that speed is there as well. And then finally, you bring that big gun to the table of functional annotation. So we have our, li our short list generated by what's real and who's it in. And now we say which of those, and there's always a list. It's never just, it's very rarely just one. Um, you always have this short list at the end, and you have to say which of those short lists is worth following up first. And that's where you leverage what's already known or, or guessable based on some good uh, modeling. So some smart modeling of we know this gene interacts with this other gene. We know that that gene in turn is important in this process, which might be important in bone development for this bone disease. We can then prioritize that gene in the short list as being likely functionally relevant to what's going on. So that kind of smart modeling is built into the system, and that, I mean, that, all that excited me a lot. And then the final answer to your question of what's going to make this faster is making it easy to understand. So that the last step of the data on the screen getting to the understanding in your head, that takes a fluid interface, right? That takes good software engineering and software design. And when I took a look at the system the first time from an, as an outsider, like running, you know, looking at ingenuity variant analysis from the perspective of actually, a, you know, someone trying, you know, a rival in a way. A rival, um, a customer. I was immediately impressed in how fluid, it, it just felt at home. Like I, I sat down and, and I was asked a very sensible, simple series of questions to, to start my project off. And that configured the way that the project was, was analyzed by default. I could then go back and tweak those, that default analysis to better fit my own subjective but maybe deeper understanding of the phenotype at hand, et cetera. So it, it was all very sensible. Uh, so it was fluid and sensible. And I think that last mile from the screen to the, to the inside in the head, that's, that's a key part of that speed equation as well, making mm -hmm. sure that that happens faster. And then people can publish it. Uh, they can, again, the sharing ability, being able to share quickly and amass bigger data sets, that contributes to speed too. So all of, uh, you know, many of the attributes of the platform are really built to help people get this right answer faster. And that's, that's what drew me. So finally, uh, we've been reporting on this flap over the ENCODE project, uh, yeah. debating. Yeah, so very entertaining. <laughs> where do you come down on that? Uh, I, so it's interesting you ask. So there's an imperative of scale today in science, right? The big projects are, are, are in many, you know, when I did my PhD, I, I did it on one gene. I looked at sequence variation in one gene. And that doesn't cut it now, right? You have to, you have to be doing big surveys. And I think there, science... There's a big... Uh, a motivation or incentive to come up with as big a project as you can. Is that there is. There, there's sort of a ratchet-like incentive in terms of the funding, you know, the way funding is incented, etc. Mm. Now, um, science tends to go in a cycle, I think. And there's different phases. And, and there's a big data gathering phase that happens every so often. So this was, you know, Darwin and the Beagle going out and just collecting data out there, using mm -hmm. a new tool like a yeah. fast ship yeah. to go around the world. And, and maybe a sextant helping there too, huh. but to, to gather data. It's just right? so fun to just gather go, data. Go get it. Yeah, yeah. And, and we have this, you know, now it's almost like, you know, there's in Portlandia, they say, just pickle it. It's like, just sequence it now in our field. So yeah. everybody's just sequencing and getting sequence data along with phenotype data maybe. Um, that imperative of scale is happening right now. And that's very different from what happens maybe in the next phase where you, you, you digest that data and try to distill it down Oh. To, to analytic insights, to, mm -hmm. to, to ultimately to sort of like the kind of crystalline formulas, you know, uh, Hamilton's equation in evolution or, or these kinds of very simple uh, analytical results. And when I was in grad school, I felt that's what sort of population genetics was going through a great time of that. But now we're in this big data gathering field. Okay, we're eventually going to move to that distillation field where we have to make sense of that data more. And I think then there's also a third phase that it goes through in that cycle, which is experiment. Now tweak things and see what happens. So, uh -huh. you know, developmental biologists have done this for a long time. You, mm -hmm. you, let's, let's try screwing something up and see what happens to the system. Uh, and so, the, so I think science tends to kind of go in that cycle. And we're kind of in a big data gathering phase right now. That favors these big projects, these big like Beagle-like projects or, or ENCODE. Yeah. And there's, there's inevitably, um, that's frustrating to watch to some degree because it does, it, it does, um, set, it pushes aside the kind of crucial deep, careful um, inquiry that folks do on smaller scales and that, that, uh, that has been important in science from the start. Mm -hmm. And that tension is natural to me. Like, mm -hmm. you want to centralize your resources and pool your resources to do big things, but you don't want to, to, to neglect the insights of someone working very carefully in, in a very focused way on a small but important question. 
And that question... That's, that's kind of a natural tension in science. It is. It really, I think in resource allocation. Yeah. And so you, you sound like you're coming down on sort of a generous, sort of happy side with the ENCODE, that, hey, we're, we're in this data gathering, and that's mostly what they did. Yeah. They were tempted to draw some conclusions because... Now, there, I, I am coming down on that side largely. Yeah. I think it was a very valuable project, and I think it'll prove its worth over time in, in ways that, that uh, you know, transcend the immediate sort of burst of hype about it. When, you know, immediately the, the, the stories in the paper about this, you know, uh, it, it was no surprise to anybody that so-called junk DNA, much of it may have important uh, functionality that we need to understand. So that, that wasn't a big surprise to biologists. I think it was sort of a splash in the press. And there was rightly, uh, so there was rightly criticism of how that was, how, how that was litigated in the press, mm -hmm. more so than in science itself. So Casey Bergman had great insights about uh, what the embargo process of the ENCODE papers did by making, you know, by slowing them down so they were all released together in one big, you know, uh, grand finale like fireworks style, that that potentially wasted a lot of time that could have been spent understanding that data. Um, and so there there is a valid critique to the way that big science project was carried out. That said, I think it's going to prove useful, and, and and I, you know, I respect the critiques of folks like Mike Eisen. Uh, who, very trenchant and very thoughtful about that, but I think at, at the same time they'll recognize as well that there is value in the data itself, and we'll find it. Well, we wish you the best at your new job here. Thanks. Thanks. We're talking to Nathan Pearson, principal genome scientist at Ingenuity Systems. Thanks again for having us over. Thank you. For more than a decade, Competitive Group has helped science-based companies build and execute innovative marketing campaigns. They love science. They love marketing. They love the idea of combining the two to make great things happen for your marketing communications. So, you were just telling us? Yeah, so, so I, I was remarking, I, I want to see Jonathan Eisen's interview, because I, in particular, so Jonathan is, a, is an old friend of mine, he was, he was my TA in college, and probably the, the, the biggest influence on me becoming a scientist professionally, I think, uh, in the sense that he sort of was the first person to show how fun science can be, and how you can ask you're, he, he encouraged us, even as undergraduates, to ask questions about the world that mm -hmm. were outside the lines, mm -hmm. outside the, the, the textbook itself, uh, and, and made us realize, I think, or made me realize at least, that, that, that science involved that. Science involved asking big questions and, and challenging. So, going back, do you remember any one of the story, a uh, story of any uh, particular uh, kind of things where you... it, it's it's all hazy. It's all, um, <laughs> I I don't remember a particular uh, a particular moment in class, but I, I just remember being quite inspired by Jonathan's um, by his teaching and also again by how he how he very openly framed his his scientific worldview in personal enthusiasm about the world and and trying to understand uh, how how cool the world is. Like he really he. Um, he, that was infectious, like that, that sense of, of wow, we can, we can understand things if we ask this question or that question. Infectious is a good word for him. <laughs> yes, it was. <laughs>